Uh, but today we are on week seven, week seven of our series titled The Gifts. And the vision behind this series is to teach you that the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, to bring you comfort when you feel lost, when you feel like you have no direction in life, when you feel like everything is falling apart. God loves you so much. He said, my children should never be alone. And he put his spirit inside of us to give us guidance and to share truth in our lives, to bring power and to bring freedom. It's an amazing gift to know the Holy Spirit in an intimate way. In fact, Jesus said this to his disciples, and he's speaking to us as followers in Christ. He said in John 16, verse 7, he said, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, that I go to be at the right hand of the Father. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby will not come to you. All these amazing characteristics of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He brings you comfort in times where everything is falling apart. You don't even understand where this comfort comes from. He speaks peace over your mind and your heart. He brings miraculous things into your life. But Jesus said, if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to be with you and to be in close fellowship with you. And guess what? When you're close to someone, when you love someone, when you have an intimate relationship with someone, guess what? You want to buy them gifts, right? To express that love. You want to share some gifts in their life. The same with the Holy Spirit. That's what he came to do. So he came to live inside of you, to have a relationship with you, and also bring wonderful gifts to change your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. All these things, listen, the gifts, the achievements, the abilities, the empowering, okay, this dunamis power that has come into our life has brought about by the one and same Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit owns all these gifts and he's willing to work these amazing things through your life at the right time. Pretty powerful stuff there, huh? But let me ask you this question. Have you ever received a gift from someone you didn't want? But you were trying to be nice about it. Maybe you're kind of an awkward person and you were trying to not let that expression show on your face, but maybe every expression shows on your face and so you're like, oh, thank you so much, you know? I, I love this gift. I'm gonna put it in my house. No, I'm good and well, the very next day, you're taking it back to the store. Like, you don't want this thing in your house, right? It may scare people. And so I started to think about that. Like, people can give bad gifts, but I need you to understand, God will never give you a bad gift. But at the same time, when we look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I feel like we kind of want to pick and choose some of the gifts that we want in our life. There are some things that we don't understand the purpose of, so we don't think we need certain gifts in our life. So let me say it loud and clear. God cannot and God will not give his children bad gifts. Every gift that comes from the Father is good for your life. Every gift that comes from the Father will bless you and benefit not only your life, but everybody else around you. There's a purpose in every gift that God gives you. Let me show you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is, the character of God, the, the loving character of the Father we serve. Everyone gets in on it. Listen to this. Everyone benefits. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit, the Spirit of God, to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. Listen to this. Wise counsel. Clear understanding, simple trust, healing the sick, miraculous acts, proclamation, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All these gifts have a common origin, but are handed out one by one by the Spirit of God. Right? It's amazing. So all these gifts come from the Holy Spirit to bless your life. But what do we do? Just like we do with other people, we like to pick and choose. We're like, all right, God, okay, I'll take the gift of healing, right? I'll take that. I could use some healing over my life. I could use some healing over my mind. And I would love to be able to pray over people and just be like, you're healed in the name of Jesus and see these miraculous things like we read about in the Bible. For some of us, maybe you're saying, God, I want that word of knowledge. I want to be able to see somebody I've never met before and supernaturally know something about their life and speak it over them and then their face be like, whoa, how would you know that, right? Maybe you've asked God for the gift of prophecy. 
God, I want to know the future because I'm in a relationship right now and I don't really know where it's going. So God, if you could just help me out with direction in the future, that would be amazing for me or just help edify myself and edify other people. See, a lot of times we look at the gifts, the listing of what the Holy Spirit can do in our life. And we're like, I want that one. I want this one. I would love that. But if we were to be honest, there are certain gifts that maybe you looked at and said, I don't need that. If we were to be honest, maybe when it comes to the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues, a lot of us said, nah, pass, <laughs> right? Depending on your background, where you grew up, what you saw. Some of us have a past where we've seen the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues misused in crazy ways. Maybe people were running around the service throwing chairs and you're like, I don't know what's going on here but I'm never coming back to this. If that's what the gift is all about, I don't want it. Pass. People love to misuse, though, what God has given them. People have their own agendas, and people will also like you to see the anointing that's on their life, and they'll misuse the gifts that God has given them. Let me say it loud and clear again. God is not weird. People are weird. So again, don't allow weird people to scare you away from the gifts from the good father that were meant to benefit your life. Do you believe that every gift that comes from God is good? Then why would there be some gifts you look at and say, I don't need it? Think about it. For he is the creator. And if he created it for you to receive, it is to benefit you. And so here's what I realized as I was diving into the text, okay? Um, Here's a revelation. You will never desire what you do not understand the purpose of. Okay, so hear me out. You will never desire what you do not understand the purpose of. Okay, the Bible says to desire all the gifts, every one of them. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 31. But earnestly desire and strive for the greater gifts. Now listen, though, if acquiring them is going to be your goal. But you desire something because you know the purpose. There are things in your past you didn't desire, but you desire them now, right? In the past, you did not desire a budget. Let's be honest. You didn't want no budget. You didn't want any talk of a budget in your house. But then you got yourself into debt. (laughs) And now you're looking at that bank account and you're seeing negative, negative, negative. And you're like, okay, God, I think it's time. I understand the purpose of a budget over my life. For some of us, you said, I don't need to eat healthy. Come on. To be honest, I don't need to eat healthy in my life. There's no point of eating healthy until your blood pressure went up and you about passed out walking up the stairs. And now you're saying to God, okay, okay, I'm gonna listen now. I understand the purpose of eating healthy so that I can keep thriving, all right? And not just trying to survive. Purpose changes when you understand the desire. Purpose in your life will start to change. So let me clear up some misconceptions about the gift of tongues. Let me ask you this question. Do you have to speak in tongues to be full of the Holy Spirit? The answer is no. You do not have to speak in tongues to be full of the Holy Spirit. I have preached over and over again. Jesus worked through the power of the Holy Spirit. The miraculous things that Jesus did was through the power of the Holy Spirit to show us how we can live. Through that power and that freedom. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So he did mighty miracles. He was able to heal the sick and cast out demons. But as far as we know, it's not recorded in the Bible. Jesus, the son of God, never once spoke in tongues. And he never once interpreted tongues either. So here is Jesus Christ, the son of God who worked in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he never spoke in tongues or interpreted tongues. And that's where a lot of us are like, all right, check that off my list. I don't need it. But hold up. Jesus did tell his disciples it was coming. Here's what he said in Mark chapter 16, verse 17. He said, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. Do you want that gift? To be able to cast out demons in your life, to be able to cast out the old addictions that want to keep you in bondage, to be able to cast out the enemy from your home and from your family and from your relationships. That's an amazing gift. Because in the name of Jesus, we celebrate this. We say, hallelujah, demons have to run away. The enemy has to leave. He can't touch us because of the name of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. He didn't stop there, though. He said they will also speak in new tongues. 
So here's what Jesus said. He said, prepare for this. Okay, accompany those who believe in my name. They will be able to drive out demons and they will also be able to speak in new tongues. But some people do not like this subject. Okay, either you grew up in a background where you never saw it, you thought it was weird, or you grew up in a background where you were bullied to do it. You were almost bullied to speak in tongues and you were told if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, almost like you were not special in God's eyes. And so because you saw all these things happening, but you were not speaking in tongues yourself, maybe you walked away from the church, you don't understand it, you're scared of it, and you just don't want to accept it into your heart. So let me get rid of the misconceptions here, okay? This is not true. Speaking in tongues is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Speaking in tongues is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit, meaning it's one of the nine gifts. It is not the only gift showing you that you have evidence of the power of God, the Spirit of God living inside of you. It's just one of the gifts that is available for your life if you, listen, if you want it. Because that's what this message is all about today. I'm going to describe the purpose of it, but I'm going to ask you, do you even want the gift? Okay, but again, why would you not want a gift from our Heavenly Father? I want to show you this uh, passage of Scripture. And I remember hearing this for the first time a long time ago, and it just blew me away. It's something I never heard preached on stage. It's found in Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verses 2 through 6. And it states, When Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? When you believed, he asked them, no, they replied. Listen to the wording here. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, a lot of us have grown up in churches like that as well. We know the Father, we know the Son, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. All we've been taught is that the Holy Spirit is weird and you need to get away from him. But listen, uh, he's making it very clear. Right now, Paul is saying, listen, no, you need the Holy Spirit in your life to bring power and freedom, Okay. So they said, we've never heard of the Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Meaning they heard John, they repented of their sins, they were baptized, but they were not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They still had not given their life over to Jesus. And so now Paul is saying, it's time to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then after they were baptized in the name of Jesus, Paul laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues. Does it stop there? They spoke in tongues and they also what? They prophesied. Two of the gifts of the Holy Spirit took place the moment that the Holy Spirit moved in their life because they gave their life over to Jesus Christ. The moment you give your life over to Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God comes in his fullness in you. But listen, we can hinder the Spirit when we don't understand. We can tell the Spirit of God, no, I don't want to listen. Just like God will give you direction over your life. Hey, don't go into that relationship. How many times have you said, God, but I want that relationship? God's like, listen, I'm giving you a choice. I'm giving you direction. It's not good for your life, but I'm still going to allow you to make the choice to jump into something toxic or be protected by my will for you. It's the same with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is up to you to decide if you want to receive these certain things in your life. But again, speaking in tongues is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts. They were able to prophesy and speak in tongues. And if I were to be honest with you, this week, I pray heavy over every message, and I spent a lot of time in the Word of God, and I got a lot of scriptures for you today, okay, because it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what the Word of God states, Um, but God just showed me more revelation after more revelation after more revelation, and I have so many exciting things to share with you, but I asked the Lord, how do I present this to people who come from both sides? who come from a side that I don't want anything to do with this and also come from the side where I've seen it misused and it scares me. And so here's what the Lord placed on my heart. The gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues was not meant to be a burden for the church. 
The gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, was not meant to divide the church or tear churches apart, but it's, again, it's a good gift from the Father when you understand the purpose, when you understand why God has given us this gift. So that's my message today. I want you to understand the purpose, then let you decide if you want the gift or not. The title of today's message is this, Speaking Mysteries. Speaking mysteries. There are three things that I see with the gift of tongues, and I want to break this down for you today. Point number one is this. The gift of tongues can be a supernatural message to others. The gift of tongues can be a supernatural message to other people to evangelize the gospel. In fact, in the original Greek text out of the New Testament, when you see tongues, it's also translated languages. So maybe in your translation, you might see some tongues, and then some of you might see some languages instead. But this gift of tongues, here's the definition, means that you can speak to other people about Jesus, even though you don't know how to speak their language. That's pretty cool because communication can be a barrier or a bridge. Meaning in our life, if you're not able to communicate with somebody, then there is a wall between you and this person. You don't know how to get close to them. But sometimes the Holy Spirit steps in and says, let me get rid of that wall. Let me break it down. And I'm going to do something supernatural through your mouth. I will grab a hold of your mouth, speak through you the gospel to somebody else. And you're like, God, can you do that with me? Like, I felt Spanish class. Like, <laughs> you sure you could do something like that with me? The gift is available for you today. But let me also ask you this question. Does communication matter? Yes. Communication matters a lot because communication, bad communication can cause division. Listen, but healthy communication can bring in healing. And I believe the best example of good communication or bad communication is, is with this. Are you married? <laughs> Are you in a dating relationship right now, right? What happens when there's no communication in the marriage? You're divided. And Jesus also said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. So when you're no longer communicating with each other, you let a lot of other things into your heart. You let a lot of other things into the relationship and you become distant with each other. And eventually over time, you will fall apart unless you learn how to communicate properly. Communication was a key to grow closer together. The Father wants you to speak to him too. A lot of us treat God like that distant friend that we talk to every once in a while when we want something. Do you have a friend that calls you every now and then just because they want something from you? Do you see that as a friendship? No, they just want something out of you. We do the same thing with God instead of talking to him every day, which he's available for you to talk to him. We only come to him for certain things things, okay? So when the communication is not there, we start to lose intimacy. We start to lose the relationship. We start to lose the friendship. All these things start to take place. So the Holy Spirit again says, listen, I'll help you here. I will speak through you to share the gospel. I'm going to show you what I mean though. Uh, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. Okay, I'm going to read the story, then I'm going to break it down more for you. It says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And again, on the day of Pentecost, many Jews from different regions would travel in to the city of Jerusalem. So many Jews were there at this point. So all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Imagine seeing this. Imagine this taking place in the upper room. The Bible tells us about 120 people were together in the upper room. The wind starts going and these flames and these tongues of fire start to appear above their heads, showing the presence of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Everyone present was filled, listen, with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. How did they have this ability? It came from where? The Holy Spirit it came from the Father. It came from heaven. Okay, this is a gift from the kingdom of heaven. But please notice what they were doing in the very beginning. They were all together on one accord. That is very powerful to understand because Jesus said, listen, things are going to happen. I need you to wait. How many of y'all know it's hard to wait? You got some friends right now and you know who exactly they are. They would never wait with you. 
They can last a day. They didn't know how long they had to wait. They didn't know what was going to happen on the day of Pentecost. But God already had a plan. See, you may not understand all the things that God is planning for your life, but all you have to do is wait and believe and be in unity. And because they were in unity, believing in what Jesus said, guess what? Miracles started to happen. When you believe together, miracles will happen. That's powerful. Imagine if everybody in this room had the faith to believe God can do the impossible. And we cast out doubt together. Imagine what God would do what God can do. But there were three signs that took place here that represent the presence of our holy God. The first sign was this, a mighty rushing sound. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. This is cool to me, but both in the Hebrew and the Greek, and again, I'm I'm a nerd when it comes to this stuff, but in both the Hebrew and the Greek, the word for spirit is the same word for breath and wind. Okay, so the word for spirit, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, is the same word for breath and wind according to the Hebrew and Greek. Let me show you an example of this. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the Spirit of God hovering over the surface of the waters. He was hovering over the surface of the waters. Uh, Something that's very interesting to me is how the Holy Spirit is always related with water. And I believe it leads to baptism because we are baptized by full submerging ourselves into water. We are dead in our sins. We raise in Christ. But one of the most interesting stories out of the Bible too is that there was this demon-possessed man. When the demons were cast out, the demons were not allowed to go upon the water. They weren't allowed to touch the water. Why? Because water brings life. And this represents the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters in the very beginning. But now let me read the same verse to you in the common English translation. It says, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea and God's wind. God's wind was over the water. God's Holy Spirit was over the water. God's wind was over the water. And this blew me away because last Sunday, again, if you were at the building, we prayed over the building. And we have some amazing footage that will be coming out uh, in the Believe the Impossible series. I can't wait to show you. But as we prayed, uh, God was doing some supernatural things. I could feel his presence there. Could you? Can I ask you that? Is that fine? It's okay. It's okay. All right. I could feel his presence there. I could feel him moving. And um, we prayed over the building. We sang worship there. It was really cool. But later I had someone come up to me and they said, I don't know if you noticed this, but while you were praying, the wind picked up. While you were praying, all of a sudden, this, this, this gust of wind started to come around the building, and it just felt like the presence of God, the movement of God, and it really got me excited because every time you see wind, it represents the Spirit of God, the breath of God, this life giving into a situation. What if God is bringing life upon the building that we're moving into, the direction that he has for us? He'll do the same thing for you, too. There's times where you feel like you have no more in you to breathe, to keep going, and God just breathes into you, gives you energy, gives you strength that you did not have before. This is the presence of God. The second sign was tongues of fire. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. Fire out of the Bible always means purification and God's holy presence. Fire also represents God's direction. So when the Israelites were in the wilderness, they were led during the day, a pillar of cloud, and at night it was fire that led them. So it shows us this is the direction of God. But then Ezekiel, this is really cool, had a vision, and he saw the throne of God. I want you to hear what he saw. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, and on this throne high above was a figure whose appearance resembled a man. Listen. From what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like gleaming amber, flickering like a fire. From his waist down, he looked like a burning flame, shining with splendor. In this image, Ezekiel was allowed to see the Son of God. He was allowed to see Jesus Christ. Now, he was not able to see his face, but he saw the what? He saw the the fire. He saw the burning presence of the Lord right there. So all these signs represent the holy presence of God. The third sign, though, they were able to speak in tongues. Now, 
Think about this. God says, Jesus said, listen, the Holy Spirit is coming. I'm going to send you all these gifts. Uh, Dunamis power, mighty power is going to come into your life. The first gift God chose to use was the gift of tongues. To impact the kingdom of the gospel. To spread the gospel. Out of all the gifts, many things that we want in our life, and many of us will say, I don't need this. That was the first thing God chose to use to impact the kingdom. Here's what happened. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, also tongues, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Verse six, and when the sound was heard, a crowd gathered and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing in the upper room speaking in his own language and dialect. Do you understand how hard this is? Not only were they speaking the correct language, they were speaking with the right accent. That's hard to do. This is a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit so that the people around them would be able to understand what they were saying. The accent matters. I'm from Louisiana, but I'm not from down south. Down south, they speak Cajun. I don't even understand what they're saying half the time. I don't have that type of accent. But sometimes God sees these walls. God shows up and says, let me move the wall out of the way. I will give you the accent. I will do something supernatural through you. And I'll give you words when you don't have them. When you don't know what to say. I believe a lot of us have experienced that. A lot of us have prayed for a friend or a family member. And you went up to that person and you didn't have words planned out. You didn't know what you were going to say. But in that moment, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to speak through you and you were able to evangelize the gospel. For some of you, maybe the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of your mouth and allowed forgiveness for the first time. And you found yourself saying, I'm sorry, I forgive you. Because I realized, listen, a lot of us are like, well, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what it feels like for the Holy Spirit to grab a hold of my mouth. Okay. Have other things grab a hold of your mouth? What about anger? What about bitterness? What about gossip? Have these things grabbed a hold of your mouth and started spewing out of your mouth where you feel like you can't control? Have you ever been so mad at somebody? Rage comes out and you say all these things. Well, you this and you're that and you can go to, you can go to where? Heaven? You probably said something else. And then later, you're, you're looking at your life and what you said, and you're like, why did I say that? Because anger got a control of your mouth. So what I'm telling you today is the Holy Spirit wants to get control of your mouth and speak encouragement, speak praises to God, and evangelize the word of God to others. Verse 12 and 13, though, listen. The people stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other, but the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. And if you know the story later on, Peter says, listen, we're not drunk. It's way too early in the morning for something like that. And he starts to preach and 3,000 people come into the kingdom of God. 3,000 people get saved because of the gift of tongues taking place in this very moment. But when I read the story, I realized two groups formed because of this gift. The first group was this. The first group was curious. The first group understood that God was doing something, and so they asked God to do the supernatural in their life. They were curious to learn more. Okay, God, I see that you're doing something. I I know it's supernatural. I don't really understand it, but I'm willing to learn more. I don't want to just shut the door in what you're showing me right now, because clearly it's miraculous. It's impacting your kingdom. So God, I'm curious to learn more. But then the other group, what did they do? They became judgmental. They condemned it. They didn't understand it, so they mocked it. They must be drunk. What group are you in? And think about it. And look, I get it, okay? I come from a a kind of a strict Baptist background where the Holy Spirit was never talked about in the church. I never saw the Holy Spirit move in the church. I never once saw the gift of tongues. The first time I saw it, it scared me to death. I'll be honest with you, because I did not understand the purpose of it. But later on in life, when God started to show me his miraculous gifts are still available today, I had to learn to humble myself before his his presence, say, God, teach me what you want to teach me. Who am I to say that your gifts are not for me today? Who am I to say that these things can't happen in my life? But what group are you in? Are you willing to be curious and dive deeper into the word, the revelation of what God has for you? Or are you just saying, no, I don't want this? 
I do not want this in my life. Let me share one story with you before I get into the next point. Um, I had a friend of mine that was a pastor, and I will never forget the story he shared with me. But he said he was on an evangelistic, um, uh, he was a mission, or he was doing missions, and he was hanging out with his host home, and he went into the room by himself. Nobody else was there. And he started to pray privately between him and the Father, a private prayer language. And I'll get into that in a second. And as he prayed to the Father, the window was open. Okay. He wasn't being loud. He wasn't being disruptive. He wasn't being crazy or anything like that in the house. He was just praying to the Father, but he would speak in tongues. And so that night, he came to the dinner table, and the family was just looking at him weird. <laughs> like they were smiling at him in a weird way. You tell that they wanted to tell him something. So he said, what, what's up? <laughs> like, what's going on? And they said, listen, earlier today, you were praying in your room. You were speaking in tongues, right? He said, yeah, yeah. I'll speak in tongues when I pray to the Father. He says, um... You don't know this, but when you were speaking, you were speaking in our language perfectly. And you were sharing the gospel. And it's so cool to me. There was a woman outside, because your window was open, who was on the fence about Jesus. But because she heard the gospel coming out of your mouth in a language she knew you couldn't speak, she gave her life to Christ. And I'll never forget that story. Because it's amazing, because every gift that God has for us is for a purpose. And once you understand the purpose, you're no longer afraid of it, okay? You understand what God is doing. It's always to impact the kingdom. It's a benefit for you and a benefit for everybody else around you. And when he shared that with me, that's what opened the door for my heart to say, okay, God, I get it now. There's things that I don't understand. Help me to understand. I want to have faith. To believe that you can do the impossible, even when I don't get it at times. Okay. Point number two, though, is, is this. There is power in interpretation. There is power in interpretation. There is a line that Joseph said out of the book of Genesis that is so powerful to me. When he was in the prison cell and they needed him to interpret the dreams, listen to what he said. In Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, does not God or do not all interpretations belong to God? Do not interpretations belong to God? What is Joseph saying? He's saying, listen, tell me your dreams. I don't understand them. I can't give you a translation. I can't give you an answer, but I got a heavenly father I can run to. And he always has the answer. He always has interpretation and he will give me the answer as long as I ask him what that answer could be. And for many of you today, maybe you had a good dad here on earth who loved you and was always there for you. And so anytime you were in a bind, maybe financially you called up your dad like, hey dad, can I have some money again? I'm in a tough spot. And he bailed you out. Or maybe if you went through a breakup and your heart was broken and you were dealing with some things, you were able to call your dad and he was able to hold you. He was able to give you wise counsel and, and help you through it and heal your heart. But I get it too. There are some of us in this room and even online watching today, you did not have a good earthly father. And you don't know what it's like to run to somebody to get advice. But I'm telling you today, you can have an intimate relationship with a heavenly father that you can always run to and get an answer from. Because all interpretations belong to God. He will give an answer over your life, exactly what you need to hear, okay? Because he's a good father. So we see these gifts all of a sudden start to come out now because of the book of Acts. And now people are starting to do miraculous things and they're healing the sick and there's words of knowledge taking place. And then you fast forward in the New Testament to the Corinthian church. Now, Paul helped plant the Corinthian church, but the Corinthian church was a little wild, Okay, they had some things going on in the Corinthian church. One of the things that make me laugh a lot about the Corinthian church is that they misused the Lord's Supper. And the way they would misuse it is that people would get there early and they would grab all the bread, all the food that came with it so that nobody else can get it. They literally misused the Lord's Supper. So there was a lot of chaos that was happening in the Corinthian church. And one of the things that was happening was that, yes, the gift of tongues was being experienced, but they were just speaking it loudly. They were being distracting. There was no order to the process. And so they were speaking all these things. And so other people would come into the church, see that, and be like, nope, I'm out of here. I don't want to come back. 
And again, maybe that was your past experience. So they asked Paul some questions. And so 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing those questions. So listen to what he said about the gift of tongues according to a public worship setting, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses six through nine. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and I speak in tongues, what good will I be to you? Unless I bring you some revelation, or knowledge, or prophecy, or a word of instruction. Listen to verse 8 and 9. Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will know when it's time to get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. What was Paul saying? He was saying, listen, if you speak in a tongue to the church congregation, there must be an interpretation of the word. An interpretation must come from God. Otherwise, you just become a loud, distracting noise. That's what Paul is saying. Because we've seen so many people come in and they start to brag about the gifts in their life. But Paul also talks about this. You can have all the gifts, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. The greatest gift is to show the love of God. The first commandment is to love the Lord God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The second is to love your neighbor. So many of us are saying we love God, but we can't even love our neighbor. Because somebody hurt us, because somebody did something, yet God shows us grace every single day. So what I'm telling you is that every gift of the Holy Spirit means that God will also build you up but make an impact in other people's lives. But don't become a distracting noise. And Paul also said it like this. You can't be in agreement with somebody if you don't understand what they're saying. How can you say amen to something you do not understand? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. He says, otherwise, if you bless and give thanks to God in the spirit only. Stop right there. Because I need you to see this. A lot of times we think Paul is speaking about tongues in a negative way. He's not. He's just giving you the correct order of how to do it in a public worship setting. He's stating right here that speaking in tongues is giving thanks to God. Please notice that. He's saying speaking in tongues, blessing uh, what God is doing, giving thanks to God. But if you only do that in the spirit, how will any outsider or someone who is not gifted in spiritual matters say amen of agreement? What is the definition of amen? The definition means so be it. So be it. So when you say amen to something, you're saying, so be it. You can't say, so be it, if you don't understand what was said. So the interpretation has power for your life. It has revelation. You can't say amen to this Thanksgiving if you don't know what is being said. So again, Paul is addressing their questions on how to operate the gift properly. And so here's some simple rules that he gives us in a public worship setting. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 27, 20. I told you guys I got a lot of scriptures today, okay? No more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak, listen, one at a time. And someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is, in, is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So again, Paul is saying you can speak to God privately, You can still have a private prayer language, but if it's to the congregation, there must be an interpretation, okay? So you will be able to control your mouth. I I gotta be honest with you. Again, not knowing much about the Holy Spirit and, and the gift of tongues, I used to be afraid that if I were to open myself up to the gift of tongues, like the gift of tongues would just take me over. You know what I mean? Like all these things would just start coming out of my mouth and I might start running around like you'll just be in the middle of Walmart, grab the intercom and just go off. You know what I mean? Like just saying all these things. We've had these fears like, what if it controls me? What if it does things I don't want to do? Listen, listen, that's not what God does. Even with salvation, you had the choice. The God that we serve is a gentleman. He will never force anything on you you do not want. Even his gifts that were meant to bless your life, that were to help your life. Listen to this. Now, this is speaking about the gift of prophecy, but this is about all the gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 32 and 33. Remember, the people who prophesy are in control. They're in control of the spirit, meaning they can actually take turns. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Anytime you see disorder, anytime you see distraction, it's from the enemy, it's not from God. 
Okay, there's a story out of the book of Luke where Jesus is preaching in the synagogue and he's preaching and it says that everybody started to listen, but immediately this man that was demon possessed started to make distractions and nobody wanted to listen at that point. So he said, be quiet. He told this man that was demon possessed, be quiet because he was causing a distraction in that moment. But the Holy Spirit's not just going to take you over and do things you don't want to do. You have to accept the gift. But also, when God breathes through you, when God does something supernatural through you, there's peace. It's not chaos. There's not disorder. It's not crazy. It will make sense in the moment. But why is this important? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Paul says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, please notice this. Paul is saying, if I spoke the language of earth, but also there's an angelic language that I can speak. If I spoke both, but do not have a love for others, meaning I only wanted people to see God's anointing on me, but not allowing them to receive God's blessing through interpretation, I would only become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. One pastor said it like this, and I believe this is very powerful. Your heavenly language without love is just loud. Your heavenly language without love is just loud. When there's disorder and how it's working, God has an order to everything. I'm gonna ask uh, Miss Charlene, will you come up on stage real quick? We all give her a round of applause. <laughs> Scenes for us every Sunday, has an amazing voice. Go ahead and come over here. I'm gonna do something a little different, so cameraman, follow me the best you can. All right, so here's what happens. When you speak in tongues, we know according to the word of God, you're actually giving praise to God. You're glorifying God. It's, it's something supernatural and wonderful in your life. But again, the enemy will come in or people will come in with their own agendas and they bring disorder. They bring chaos. They're loud. They're noisy. And so everybody knows Miss Charlene has a wonderful voice. Go ahead and sing uh, a little worship song here. Holy Spirit, you are All right, that sounds good. But what if I came in the background doing this? Oh, turn me up a little bit. I got me down over here. Right? Hold on. Charlene, you're being a little too loud. Let me, let me. I want to showcase my talents right now. Stephen's like, what are you doing to my keyboard over here? Listen. All right, you can stop. If worship sounded like that every Sunday, would you come back? <laughs> no, I'm not coming back here. If worship sounded like that, you would not come back. Why? Because that's a lot of disorder. That's a lot of chaos. She, okay, she was praising God. Okay, don't get that twisted. She was praising God. I'm over here supposed to play keys to praise God. Both are praising God, but when it's out of order, when it's done in the wrong way, it was a huge distraction. But watch this. Stephen. Stephen's going to represent the Holy Spirit. You look good, buddy. All right. So the Holy Spirit says, listen, the gift is good. It gives praise to the Lord. But let's put some order to it. So he brings order, and you can go ahead and sing. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. That sounds different, doesn't it? Come can we just sing this together right now? The atmosphere, your glory, God is what I long for. See, now we can praise you. Say what one more time. Let's get a little bit louder in here, though. Let's sing it together if you know the words. Come here, come flood this place and feel the atmosphere. Your glory, God is what our hearts long for to be overcome. difference is when you listen to God's instruction and you listen to his order of things, then we all can participate in the praise. We all are benefited. We all are blessed. But before, when I was trying to showcase my own talents, which I have no talent on the piano, clearly, it caused a distraction and disorder. Thank you, Charlene. Stephen, you can stay and keep playing. But I want you to see that this is what the gift was meant to do. The gift was meant to 
build the church, but there has to be an interpretation if it's coming to the church worship public setting. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse five says it like this. I wish you could all speak in tongues. That's what Paul said. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless, oh, don't miss that. Because a lot of people take this first and they twist it a little bit. Well, Paul just tells us to speak in prophecy because nobody wants tongues in the church. But no, 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 he didn't say that. He said prophecy is greater because it builds up the church. Everybody can understand unless someone is able to interpret what you are saying by the tongue to the church. Then the whole church can be strengthened and edified at that moment. There's power in that when you understand the purpose. But this leads to my last point. And this was a revelation God just gave me. And it, I believe it's such a beautiful revelation. Point number three is this. There is a private prayer language that will give you armor. A private prayer language is not a language to people, but a heavenly language of grace spoken through you by the Holy Spirit to the Father. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse two. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll only be talking to God. Listen to the wording here. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God, since people won't be able to understand you. You'll be speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. This is why we struggle with this gift, because we have to trust the Lord in opening our mouth and speaking through us. And so we look at a gift like this and we say, well, I just don't need that. I don't understand it. I don't see how that builds me up. Okay, let me ask you this. Have you ever been at a loss at words when praying to the Father? At a hard week, a hard season, maybe you're struggling right now in a relationship. You're struggling over your finances. You're struggling on hearing from God. And so every time you come into the presence of God, you're just hard. And you're kind of saying the same things over and over again and nothing is happening. The Holy Spirit is saying, listen, I'll pray for you. That's what a private prayer language is. The Holy Spirit is saying, I'll pray for you. I know exactly what you need right now, even though that you don't have the words. And if you trust me, if you allow me to speak through you, I will speak to the good Father and he will bless you and he will give you exactly what you need, even though you don't even understand what you need in this moment. Paul made it clear, listen, do not forbid the gift of tongues in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 and 40. So my dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, but do not forbid tongues. Hear it. Hear that. Underline that. Maybe for this, this upcoming week or these next few weeks, you need to revisit the scripture over and over again. Some of these scriptures, just to be open to what God is trying to tell you. Do not forbid tongues in the worship service, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order. And I love what Paul said. He kind of did a little humble brag right here and he kind of flexed on him. He said, look, I speak in tongues more than all of you. I'm better at this gift than all of you. But there's a reason. First Corinthians 14, 18 and 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Again, please hear me out. Paul is not saying the gift of tongues is a bad thing. He's just saying there is a time, there is a place, and there is an order so that you do not become a distraction, so that you do not overpower the message that is being preached in the house. When you want people to see your anointing and your gifts and all these other things. Again, the enemy wants to distract, but the word of God will pull you in. And I'm telling you today, the Holy Spirit wants to pray over you. It's not so bad when you think about it like that. When you don't know what to say. Now, I want to show you a revelation. This blew me away, okay? Um, if you grew up in vacation Bible school or you grew up in church, you know that you were told over and over again, put on the full armor of God. What if you're missing a piece? Listen to this, Ephesians chapter six, verse 13 through 18. Therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, 
putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes. Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all these, Hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on the salvation of your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's usually where we stop. There's a verse 18. And it says, pray in the spirit. How do we miss that? Why do we stop right before that? Because people don't understand. People think it causes division. I don't want to bring it up. But listen to what he said. Pray in the Spirit at all times and every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And I started to realize when you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is praying over you to build you up, to help you. It is the will of God. How many times do we run to the wrong things to be built up? So many of us in this room, instead of running to God, we run to social media, trying to get all the likes and the loves and the shares that we can get. But the other week that comes, maybe you don't get as many likes as you got before. So you start to think in your head, God, do they still like me? Do they still see me as valuable? They're not liking my pictures. They're not loving my stuff. Do they even see me? You're trying to get the approval of people who do not care. Who are looking at you from the outside and but you're exhausting yourself for people that are not even there for you. From fake standards of social media, when the Holy Spirit says, I'm here. Okay, if you don't understand. Guess what? I don't care how long you've been studying the Bible, how long I've been studying the Bible. You will never come to a point where you say, I've arrived and I know everything. There will always be things you don't understand. There will always be mysteries that God will keep revealing to you because the word is living and breathing. But it's part of the armor. When you pray in the spirit, you don't need the approval of other people because the Holy Spirit builds you up. James chapter 1 verse 20, but you beloved, that's what the Father calls you. You're beloved in the eyes of God. Building yourselves up by most holy faith pray in the Holy Spirit and so Paul says this he says this about the church here's what we do 1 Corinthians 14 15 and 16 well then what should I do he said I will pray in the Spirit but I'll also pray with words I understand now he's talking about a public worship setting but he's not talking to the congregation he's just talking to the Father so I need you to understand this is still private Just like when you come down to the altar, you're not talking to the entire church. When you come down to the altar, you're talking to the Father. You're praying to God. So Paul says, even in a public worship setting, there are times where I will pray in the Spirit just to my Father, though. Not to the congregation, but I'll also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit to my Father. Not the congregation, but also singing words I understand. For if you praise God only in the spirit, how can those who don't understand praise along with you? Listen, a lot of us don't even know the words to the songs we sing, unless the words are up there. When you see the words clearly, you're able to sing. That's what Paul is saying. If I keep singing in the spirit, it's not a bad thing. They just won't be able to sing along with me. So God is saying, do both. I pray, I sing in the spirit, but I also pray and I sing in words that they understand. The blessing is in both. And so I wanna share this as I end my message. There are many times in that room back there before I come up on stage, I pray to the Father to give me supernatural strength to come and preach to you. Because there are many battles I don't wanna face. There are some messages that the Lord has given me that I'm like, God, I don't wanna preach that. (laughs) I'll be honest with you. Like, God, can I just preach the happy stuff and the stuff that won't cause division and make people angry? And that's not what I'm called to do. We're called to be a truth in a dark world of a lot of counterfeits. And so back there, sometimes I feel worn out and I feel tired from the week. There's a lot of things that go on in this church. And sometimes, even for me back there, I I try to pray and I'm like, God, I just don't have the words. And so there's a corner back there that I speak privately to my father and speak in tongues. And to be honest with you, when I speak, for me, it almost sounds like Hebrew. I don't even know Hebrew. I don't care to find out if it is Hebrew. 
because it's building me up. It edifies me. I can feel the Lord grabbing a hold of my mouth and speaking through me. Here's what's crazy. You know what that does for me? It encourages me because he does the same thing when I'm on stage speaking to you. Um, when I pray, a lot of you have heard me over and over again. I pray that God would grab a hold of my mouth and speak through me. There are times on this stage where I can feel God moving my tongue into a direction to preach to you something that I did not write down, something that I did not plan. But it's that revelation that changed someone's life. And it's that revelation that's even gone viral on social media that has brought so many to Jesus Christ. Just this past week, a man who wanted to commit suicide was saved because of what God is doing here in the ministries that he's doing here. Because of one of our tribes, our online tribe, reaching people all over the world. God is doing these things. But we gotta be prepped, we gotta be ready. And so praying in the spirit is not a bad thing. Let me, let me read this one last verse. And if you can, Brady, turn the music down just a little bit so they can hear me clearly. Romans chapter eight, verse 26 and 27. Here's what it says, the spirit helps us. We are very weak, but the spirit helps us with our weaknesses. We don't know how to pray as we should but the Spirit Himself speaks to God for us. He begs God for us, speaking to Him with feelings too deep for words, with groanings. God already knows our deepest thoughts and He understands what the Spirit is saying because the Spirit speaks for His people in a way that agrees with what God wants. When you pray in the Spirit, your own opinions and agendas get out of the way and the perfect will of the Father is prayed over you. It really changes a lot when you understand the purpose, when it's done in the correct order. I'm gonna be staying right here. I'm asking our worship team to come up front. Because again, the message today, it's, it's about this. I get it that some of us come from different backgrounds, but the main question I'm gonna ask you today is are you willing to receive all that the Holy Spirit has for you? Every gift that the Holy Spirit has for you. For the Holy Spirit owns all the gifts. He wants to work this power and this freedom through your life at the right time, at the right location, with those people. When you don't have words, the Holy Spirit will speak through you in supernatural ways. For the longest time, I denied the Holy Spirit. And God changed my life the moment I said, all right, Lord, I believe in everything you have for me. So maybe you're asking the question, how do I begin? Here's how. Yeah, ask God to do it. It's that simple. Run to the Father and ask Him to provide. Luke 11, 11 through 13. What father among you, if his sons ask for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will give you a scorpion? Notice the wording here is talking about demons, anything demonic. If you run to the Heavenly Father, He's not going to give you something demonic. If you then being evil, that is sinful by nature, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him and continue to ask the greatest gift for you today? It's the Spirit of God living inside of you. All you have to do is ask. So I'm going to ask and encourage. Will you humble yourself today and say, God, I just want more of you. I may not understand it all yet, but I'm ready to believe and I'm ready to receive. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you to come up front right now. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family, and thank you today for joining us.